So welcome everyone to our Sunday finale at the Whole Life Expo 2012. I'm here to introduce Sean Buckley, who is a constitutional and criminal lawyer. He's president of the Natural Health Products Protection Association, which is www.nhppa.org, and an expert in the Food and Drug uh, Drugs Act. And he's here to present Canada's new food safety laws, Know What Dangers Can Be in Your Food Legally. And I believe, Sean, will you... I, I guess we probably won't be available afterwards at your booth, but just in case, because we're closing, I think, after this. <laughs> um, but it's booth 260. If anyone wants to kind of run upstairs after the evening, I'm sure you'll also have an opportunity to talk to Sean after his talk. So if everyone can please help me in welcoming Sean Buckley. First, we'll do a sound check. Can you guys hear me? You can? Okay. Because <coughs> I can't hear myself, so when I like to hear myself talk. I usually start my lectures by asking a question. And today's question, um, when I ask it, I expect that for most of you, an answer will right away pop into your mind. You won't even have to think about it. And that's actually the answer I want, because it's one of those questions that if you think about it, and depending on what crowd you're in, you might answer it differently. <coughs> but I'm actually interested in what's in your gut, what's your gut reaction, because that will tell me what, probably what you were taught, unless you spent a lot of time to override it. So when I ask the question, it's a yes-no question, if the answer that pops into your mind right away is no, then put up your hand. Okay, so the no, hand up. But if the answer is yes, you know, and I'm talking about the answer that pops into your mind, so if that answer is yes, just do nothing, just sit still, I'm just curious to see. And the answer just simply is, do we live in a democracy? No. Oh, yeah, come on, I want the first... <coughs> it's okay, but this is still instructive, so even... but. <clears throat> Even for you, some of you who put your no hand up, you know, I'm sure yes was competing there because we're just so taught from an early age. We're taught we live in a democracy. We're taught this is an, a free country. It's one of the best countries to live. We're actually taught to be thankful and grateful for all the freedoms and democracy we have. And, I mean, I know I, I was groomed to fight the Cold War, like, you know, literally where my generation was supposed to be prepared to die for this stuff. And today's Remembrance Day where people have died for our freedom. It's uh, a somber day. <clears throat> so we're conditioned to think we're in a democracy, and that's somewhat misleading because the word democracy actually is supposed to describe a state of affairs where people have a say in their governance, where you actually you vote on issues that are important for you. And in preparing for this lecture, I had to think, okay, I'm 47. How many times in my life have I had the opportunity to vote on any issue, let alone ones that are important to me? And I've, I've been able to vote on issues twice in my 47 years. So I live in BC, and you know, about eight years ago, we had a referendum on whether or not we wanted to change our electoral system in the province, and so I got to vote on that. And the only other time I got to vote is I live in Kamloops, and the city was wanting to impose water meters on the populace, <coughs> and the citizens were getting a little grumpy about that, so the city thought, hey, let's hold a referendum, and you know we can convince people this is a great idea, and then go ahead with our popular mandate. So the city held a referendum. The population just resoundingly said, no, we do not want water meters, and then the city promptly installed water meters. They didn't, they didn't tell us beforehand they were wireless ones, so I personally know two people that are now completely disabled in Kamloops because of these wireless meters. But that really wasn't an exercise in democracy because it was pure public relations that just backfired, right? Mm -hmm. So it really means in my lifetime, 47 years, I've had the opportunity to vote on one issue, I've never had the opportunity to vote on a federal issue. 
I mean, we could start a war. I'm not going to get the opportunity to vote. D isn't that something citizens should be allowed to vote on? I mean, we in Canada, we send our armed forces to kill people far away without declaring war, and I, I think that's something we should be able to vote on. We'll never be able to vote on our level of taxation or, you know, a hot issue in BC is should we be allowing oil pipelines. We're not allowed to vote on these things. And yet we call ourselves a democracy, and I'm just pointing out that <coughs> that is a misnomer. We're not, we're not a democracy. We elect every four or five years, I'm, I'll just talk federally now to keep it simple, but we elect every four or five years people who will then get to make the decisions, right? Like in a democracy, the people make the decisions. No, we elect those who will have the power to make decisions. And in theory, they're supposed to represent the interests of those in their riding, right? But isn't the practice that they vote along party lines? I mean, it, it is. Everyone's nodding. It is very exceptional for the party whips to allow MPs to vote their conscience or vote what their constituents say. It's very rare. So we don't even, even that representative, I was going to say democracy, if you were just <coughs> trained, but really what we have is an elected autocracy. <coughs> well, it is. I mean, that would be a better way to describe it. We have an elected autocracy because we have no direct say in our governments. And this is new to some people because most of us aren't exposed to even thinking, wait a second, are we a democracy? Do we have any control over our lives? Because we're taught that we do. We're taught that, ev we're taught that everything is really, really good in Canada. And uh, we're not. We're not a democracy at all. We have very little say. Now, there is a very positive thing because we've at least inherited parliamentary traditions. And this is important, especially for a populist that doesn't get a say in the passing of laws. So our parliamentary system, we get notice and we get an opportunity to petition. So before a law becomes effective in Canada, it's introduced into Parliament. It has to go through three different votes and this is, these are usually spaced out so people have an opportunity to petition Parliament for changes to the laws that are being introduced. And <coughs> usually a law will go to a committee with some expertise in the area. So for example, I'm concerned with the Food and Drug Act. That's my concern. All things being equal, in the normal course of events, if the government wanted to amend the Food and Drug Act, they would introduce a law in Parliament, probably called an Act to Amend the Food and Drug Act, and then it would go through different readings, it would go to the Standing Committee of Health, and we would have an opportunity to petition the government for changes, to have input. And I use the word petition deliberately because I want you to appreciate that in other forms of government, so in totalitarian regimes or monarchies, people petition the government for changes to the law. Is that w what we do any different, if you think about it? No. So I, I don't want you thinking that you're particularly free just because we can petition the government, but it still is a protection for us, and it's really a protection we need to cherish and fight for because it's the only input we have before our elected autocrats impose laws on us. Okay, do you understand that? So if we lose this notice, if we lose the opportunity to have input towards law, then we don't even have you know, the protections of a parliamentary system, do we? Yeah. And I bring this up because it just happened. So this Bill C-38, this omnibus budget bill, <coughs> was passed in very quick fashion and Basically what happened, so it's called the budget bill. Every year the government has to pass a budget to keep spending money and that's where they will put things in dealing with the tax code and stuff like that. So if the government said we're going to reduce your taxes by 5% this year, it would be in the budget bill. But what the government did with the last budget bill is they included a whole bunch of amendments to acts that had nothing, nothing at all to do with finance. And some of it made the media. I mean, it certainly made the media that the opposition was concerned that Parliament was being undermined and the changes to some of our environmental laws made the media. But you know, aside from me as a source, because I've written and I've lectured on this, but I'm not aware of anyone else alerting people to changes in the Food and Drug Act. So aside from me, has anyone heard at all about changes to the Food and Drug Act that took place in this budget bill? No. Now it, and 
I'll go through the changes. You can, I'm going to frighten you. It's, it's just scary stuff. Our food safety law has just been absolutely gutted, and it's been done in a way that undermined the single protection we have, which is this parliamentary process. Because it was stuck in this omnibus bill. I printed it off. I forget now. It was over 450 pages long. So I would actually be surprised if your MP read it. I, I would genuinely be surprised if your MP read it. And I would be super surprised if your MP understood it, let alone even just the changes to the food safety laws. And <clears throat> do we have any sort of representative government if our government is voting on laws so that they don't even have a clue the ramifications on us? I, I just bring it to your attention because I used to think this only happened in the states where they give the members a phone book and then a short period of time to vote on it and then pass it. And then, like, that just makes a mockery. I was going to again say democracy, but <coughs> it makes a mockery of even the parliamentary process. And so let's talk about some of these changes. So, um, <coughs> and I guess before I do that, I need to explain kind of how our food safety laws work in Canada, just so you, you can appreciate the change. So basically, we have an act called the Food and Drug Act. And that act has some real fundamental protections for food safety. So, for example, one thing the act does is it says you can't sell food that's adulterated. So you can't put non-food ingredients in food and sell it to the public. And it, you don't have to think very hard about that one to realize, yeah, that actually keeps us safer. Another part of it, uh, the Food and Drug Act I like, is it prohibits selling food that has a poisonous or harmful substance in it. <coughs> well, again, pretty no-brainer, right? There's no way you'd undermine a protection like that. Uh, one that I like is, we all know how the minister, they can set standards for food. Like, so if you go and buy grade A beef, you, you know that it's going to adhere to a certain standard of quality, kind of prevents against fraud. But what most of us don't realize, the minister can also set food s standards for safety reasons. There's a part in the act where if the minister determines foods have to adhere to a certain standard to prevent injury, or harm to the consumer, the minister can set these standards. So some of our food safety standards are actually set not to prevent fraud, but because the minister determines they're necessary to prevent injury. Now, <coughs> those are some of the key provisions in the Act. In addition to the Act, there's this whole body of regulation. And the regulations, I, I don't exaggerate, it's about a hundred years of kind of acquired wisdom on how to keep food safe. Like we've been managing food safety <coughs> for over a century, and our current Food and Drug Act, if you were going go back to about the mid-30s, you'd recognize it. Like that's kind of when our current form of the act took place. And what would happen is, is we'd just learn. So for example, people want to sell orange popsicles. Well, how much dye can you put in a popsicle without having people getting sick or injured? Like, you don't know at first, and, and you learn, and then after you learn, it goes in the regulations. And so when I say, you know, our food safety regulations are about 100 years of accumulated wisdom, it literally is. And, you know, I'm quite happy about our food regulations. So we've got the Act, <coughs> we've got these regulations, and it used to be, I mean, you could go to your grocery store and buy food, and you could be confident that the food adhered to our safety laws. Now, the first kind of chink in that statement comes in about, well, it comes in exactly 2004. They amended the Food and Drug Act to allow the minister to exempt certain foods or classes of foods from all of the regulations or any of them and some of the food safety protections in the Act. So it's kind of like if you imagine our food safety laws are this ship and we're all on this ship and we're just kind of sailing through hazardous waters you know, the ship is keeping us out of the waters. In 2004, a torpedo hit the ship. The ship didn't sink, it kept sailing because it had some backup protections. And what those protections were, um, as odd as it is, I mean, I understand, you know, we create all this food safety law to keep us safe, and then we let the minister grant some exemptions. But there were some safety things in there. And the first safety feature in this exemption is the minister couldn't exempt a food from any of our safety regulations without first publishing it in the Canada Gazette. Now, does everyone know what the Canada Gazette is? It's just the, the government newspaper and it's where the government publishes notices. So at least you would know and the media would know 
because the Gazette is actually watched quite closely. So before an exemption could take effect, it had to be published in the Canada Gazette. Another safety feature was, <coughs> is that before the minister could grant an exemption to any of our food safety laws, he or she had to determine that basically that it was safe. The exact words were, they had to determine it would not be harmful to the health of the purchaser or consumer. So okay, that's a little reassuring, isn't it? So before they exempt the food from our safety laws, you have to make sure it's not going to be harmful to the purchaser or consumer. So that's not bad. And then the final protection in there was that uh, they were temporary. So uh, an exemption would last a maximum of two years. And the idea was, we've granted the exemption because we've got some more wisdom and we'll amend the act or regulations so that then it becomes a permanent exemption. So, and Parliament then would have oversight, right? So those were some of our protections. Now, this Bill C-38 comes along and they basically take every single one of those protections away. So now the minister can grant an exemption to a, our food safety law. Oh, just wait, let me back up. <coughs> Another protection that I forgot to mention before the changes where the minister could not allow a poisonous or harmful substance. So it didn't matter. You couldn't exempt a food that would have a poisonous or harmful substance in it, right? Which kind of makes sense. So now Bill C-38 comes along and now the minister can grant an exemption to our food safety laws without determining that it's safe. Okay, so remember, he had to, before ha she had to determine it wouldn't be harmful to the purchaser or consumer. That's gone. Now, think about that for a second. How can it possibly be in anyone's interest, I'm talking about the public here, for the minister to exempt a food from our food safety laws without determining that it's safe? Like, can you get a, I'd, I'd love you to ask your MP, say, you know, you voted for this law and it's basically, it allows the minister to grant exemptions to our food safety laws without determining it's safe. Is that okay with you? How's that, you know, like, how's that in our interest? The, um, the minister can now allow substances that are poisonous or harmful. I need to say that again because it's almost unbelievable, isn't it? Now, I'm not making this up, by the way. I wish I was. The minister can now grant an exemption allowing food that has a substance that's poisonous or harmful. How can an MP vote for that? I mean, it's absolutely crazy. There is no longer any publication requirement. Doesn't need to be published. I'll, I'll get back to that because this gets a little scary for us. The, um, <coughs> they're permanent. There's no two-year limit anymore. And so there's no need to change the act or regulations. So we're now in a situation where we have this actually very good set of food safety laws. The minister can now exempt from any of the regulations. The minister can allow adulteration of foods. The minister can allow poisonous or harmful substances. Remember I told you about these safety standards and I, I cannot get my head around this one. You know, because on the one hand, the Act says the minister can only set these safety standards if the minister believes it's necessary to prevent injury, and now we allow the minister to exempt foods from these safety standards. Like, how is that possible? And um, <coughs> we, it doesn't have to be published. And the publication thing, it's interesting because, as I say, before 2004, you could go into your grocery store, buy any food, and be confident the food adhered to our safety laws. You know, assuming there's not fraud on the manufacturer's part. As of 2004, <coughs> you go, go buy your groceries. Well, you weren't sure that they apply to the food safety laws, but at least you could verify if you were concerned. You can log on to the government website, go through the Canada Gazette, and look at the notices, which are really instructive, actually. Like, in, when I was analyzing this, I was going through the notices, and I made a personal decision, I'm only buying organic wine because I was super surprised at the number of GMO ingredients they're allowing, approving for alcohol and wine. Like, it's, yeah, you don't think of GMO in the wine, and so it surprised me, and now I just will only buy organic wine. So, um, but it's just, <coughs> now, um, before you could at least go through the Gazette and see if your food was exempted, but now, you, you, 
you won't know because the minister doesn't have to publish any exemptions. And this is already law. Like, I can't tell you if there's been wholesale exemptions granted to our food safety law. Like, you cannot tell. You can't hire somebody like me to tell you because I don't know. And there's, there's no way for me to find out. Uh, it's not the law that they have to publish. Now, the minister may voluntarily publish, and I hope the minister does. And, you know, but I'm not sure because I was trying to figure out, like, why are they doing this? Like, because none of it makes sense. Why take all these safety precautions away? Like, you want to allow the minister to grant exemptions for poisonous food? Do you think you know why? No, it's um, Leona, yeah. You know, but this, this would have been written by Health Canada. Like, she wouldn't have written this. So, um, but this was voted on. It was the budget bill. I mean, I, it was voted on by most parties. The Conservatives definitely carried the day. So, <coughs> I kind of speculate, actually, there's, I think there's a whole bunch of GMO stuff coming down the pipe, and they just don't want it to be so up. That's just my speculation. Like, there's a reason for it. And I also think we're going to be adopting some foreign laws. And that leads me to the next big change, is the minister now can, in one of these exemptions that he or she doesn't have to publish, or by regulation, adopt any document. Okay? Now, this is actually, and it'll take me a minute for me to explain this to sink in, but it's actually a transfer of sovereignty of, you know, over our food safety from Parliament to whoever, whoever writes whatever documents are, are adopted. So, for example, the minister could grant an exemption exempting all fruits and vegetables from our current regulations governing chemical amounts that are allowed in food and say, you know what, there's an association of chemical companies in China and they've created their own list of chemicals and how much you can put into food and I'm adopting those lists in this exemption. So any fruit and vegetable is fine as long as it adheres to that list. Or the minister could pass a regulation, and I also I use this as an example because I think it's coming down the pipe, uh, adopting the European Union uh, regulations for food claims. I, I predict that's going to happen. Now, <coughs> when I say this is a transfer of sovereignty, is let's say, you know, using my first example of the minister granted an exemption allowing fruits and vegetables to have chemicals in an amount set by a trade association in China, and you're unhappy with the chemical amount, who do you lobby? Do, do you like you to go to China and, and lobby the trade association? Do you, like, do you see the problem? And if we adopt any European food laws, do we go to the European Union and lobby? Would they even pay attention to us? We're not citizens of any European nation. Like, do you see how this becomes problematic? So, because before, Parliament had supervision. So, I mean, it, it's a no-brainer for the law part, right? Food and Drug Act, if there was going to be a change to that, it has to be a bill introduced into Parliament. And, and you can all see clearly how Parliament supervises that. But some people fail to realize even how much supervision Parliament has over regulations, because Parliament doesn't vote on regulations. So what happens with the regulation is, the government just publishes it in the Canada Gazette, and then there's a comment period. So people are invited to, to comment on you know, what's good and what's bad about it. But what happens behind the scenes that you don't know is under our Statutory Instruments Act, the clerk of the Privy Council in cons consultation with the Deputy Minister of Justice examines every regulation and asks a whole bunch of questions. Like, first of all, is this regulation authorized by the act that it's being passed under? Does this regulation unduly trespass upon existing rights and freedoms? Well, that's a protection, isn't it? Does this regulation violate our Charter of Rights and Freedoms or our Bill of Rights? They're actually required by law to ask these questions and examine, and if the answer is no, the regulations go back to be amended. And then the regulations have to be published a second time before they become law. And even though they're not voted on, though, Every regulation is permanently before a, a committee of both the Senate and the House of Commons, and that committee can put a resolution in either the Senate or the House to repeal the whole regulation or any part that they think should be repealed, and if the vote's yes, it's gone. So understand, prior to this amendment allowing the minister to adopt any document, Parliament had sovereignty over our food safety, and now part of that sovereignty has been given 
basically to the minister who can send it wherever. And this is a fundamental change because we kind of have to ask our question, okay, we don't live in a democracy, we're in an elected autocracy, but at least our elected representatives are responsible to us every four years. I mean, they do want to get re-elected. We have to give them that. So there's that pressure. And through Parliament, they have supervision over our food safety. Why would we give that away? How is that in our interest? Like, is it onerous to pass regulations? Is it onerous to pass laws? No. So I don't know the answer, but something's happening here, and this isn't an accident. Something's coming down the pipe, which is why they, they've passed this law. And now another change is um, to our prescription drug, the way we regulate prescription drugs. So right now, prescription drugs, if the government wants to add a prescription drug or subtract a prescription drug, there's a list, but it's, it's a, they have passed regulations to create this list. So if they want to change the list, they have to pass a regulation, which, you know, publish, examination by the clerk, comment period, publish again, and Parliament has the right to strike the reg at any time. Now, what the change now is, is <coughs> the minister can just add or subtract to the prescription drug list without passing a regulation. Now, like I say, passing regulations is not onerous. So why change that? And it's, it's interesting. I'll tell you why I'm concerned in a second. But when it, the law now says the minister can add or subtract to the prescription drug list, that means Health Canada can because the minister isn't the expert. It's going to be Health Canada that says, add this, add that, and it'll be added. And by the time you find out, it's already too late. And it's just interesting because, you know, some prescription drugs are really important. And, but now they could be removed without really any public oversight by our elected representatives. Or drugs that maybe shouldn't be approved because they're dangerous can be added to the list. And it's just understand the reason why we have this regulation process is so that Parliament can supervise the bureaucracy and prevent corruption and can prevent abuse. And why would we give that up? You know, if somebody was to ask me, Mr. Buckley, are you personally concerned about corruption in Health Canada? Any guess what the answer would be? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I am concerned about corruption in Health Canada and the drug approval process. And I hold that concern largely because of people like Dr. Shiv Chopra. Yeah. You guys, most of you know who he is. For those of you who don't, <coughs> um, you really should educate yourself about this man because he's one of those rare individuals that just oozes integrity. The man has integrity. He was a senior Health Canada scientist in the drug approval process. In, I think, can somebody correct me, like didn't he spend 30 years in Health Canada as a drug approval scientist? He even ran their veterinary drug approval branch for a while. And what happened is, is he was being asked to approve a, uh, I think it was a bovine growth hormone, and you know, he's looking at it and he realizes this isn't safe. This is not safe. We do not want humans consuming this in beef. And so he recommended a refusal, and then the Health Canada management started working around his decision to get it approved, and he basically became a whistleblower and eventually forced the Senate to call a bunch of Health Canada scientists to determine what was going on. I think five testified in front of the Senate, and they basically all outlined how, oh yeah, we'll determine a drug isn't safe, we'll recommend it, it'll be refused, and then Health Canada management walks around. And I was haunted... He reproduced in his book, uh, Corrupt to the Core, which I recommend that everyone purchase and read. Uh, one of the scientists, Dr. M Margaret Hayden, actually told the CBC after the Senate hearings that, well, yeah, after a while, like, so you're, you're a drug approval scientist at Health Canada. After a while, you get to recognize the pattern that they use to get around your decision. Like, can you imagine that? It happens so frequently that if you're there for a while and you recommend a drug isn't safe, you'll understand how they're going to get around your decision. It's predictable. So I, I do have a worry about our drug approval process, and I don't see how it is at all in our interest that that supervision has been taken away from Parliament, and I, I invite you to ask your MP how this is all of a sudden in our interest. It's not. 
and it's a transfer of power from Parliament to Health Canada, the bureaucracy. And it's, you know, it's, it's interesting because <coughs> if you look into the chemical pharmaceutical drugs, they just carry an enormous risk. And Health Canada goes out of its way to protect those drugs. I find it really actually fascinating because um, what happens is, is if, let's say on a natural health product, if, you know, somebody phones Health Canada and complains about a tummy ache, I mean, we're talking full recall. I've seen some, you know, people will write to Health Canada or the minister and complain about losing access. And people show me the letters they get back, and some of them actually, Health Canada brags about how many recalls they've forced of natural health products, and they'll use words for things like, well, for potentially dangerous, you know, reactions. Because we all know there's not a single documented death in Canadian history that anyone can point to, and I've done an access to information request and dared Health Canada, you show me then. Because they know I lecture and say there hasn't been. No one can point to one. So, and I'm not saying there's, there's zero risk, but it's just interesting. They privilege the chemical pharmaceuticals <coughs> where, you know, they literally, if people are dying, they fight to keep them on the market. And yet natural health products are being taken away. And it's funny, it just seems, um, you know, people are calling and complaining so often about products being taken away that now I, it's kind of like, okay, well, what's, what's kind of the, the treat of the week, you know? And for the last two weeks, it's been natokinase is being taken off the market. And I, some people are nodding. So um, for those of you, I'm not a, a doctor or a naturopathic doctor. I'm, I don't have expertise in, in natokinase. But, you know, in looking at it, it's used widely as a blood thinner, very safely. It, but it's used for a lot of other things, pain management, fibromyalgia, dissolving clots, uterine, fibroids, things like that. Like, it's widely used. And... I had to make inquiries because a client was being asked to recall because what happened was Health Canada just contacted everyone who had a license application in for natokinase saying we're not going to approve your license so it's illegal full stop and recall. Not stop selling, you recall right away. Unfortunately, some of the manufacturers have not recalled. They're allowing people more time to access it before they can switch to other things. So. Um, <clears throat> but it's just fascinating because, you know, I'm having breakfast this morning, I won't mention the guy's name, and he's saying, oh, did you see the story in the, the New York Times about this new um, blood thinning drug that when people show up at the hospital and they're dying, they have no way of stopping it. There's, the hospitals are helpless and the people die. What's that? Okay. So I had forgotten the name, actually, of the drug. Thank you. So it's just, I thought, isn't that ironic, right? Like, so here hospitals are currently experiencing problem with an approved chemical pharmaceutical drug for blood thinning where they can't keep you alive if you're dying from the drug and yet we're taking natokinase and I searched the Health Canada adverse reaction database for natokinase there has not been a single complaint ever not even my tummy hurts there hasn't been a single report and yet they're removing natokinase from the market and actually uh, that's created a situation where we, we need to start educating ourselves, well, how do we get stuff like this? Okay, I mean, <coughs> natokinase is pretty significant. Another one that, that's very troubling, about six weeks ago I was writing an article on just my concerns on losing access, and I called practitioners, well, what's the flavor this week? And it was desiccated thyroid. Because they, yeah, oh, it's a whole, yeah, okay, so... This audience appreciates the value of desiccated thyroid. I mean, we have thyroid problems writ large, no small measure because of all the fluoride that we have in our, our water that destroys thyroids. And a lot of people just cannot manage on the approved chemical pharmaceuticals. Medical doctors use desiccated thyroid. I mean, Dr. Mark Starr wrote a whole book on <laughs> why desiccated thyroid is, is the treatment of choice. And they're complaining because people need access to desiccated thyroid and they don't have access. And so I think we need to talk about, well, what do you do when Health Canada removes something? And there's kind of two categories. Like things like natokinase are non-prescription. Things like desiccated thyroid, actually it's on the prescription drug list. And so different rules apply here. So first of all, for things like natokinase that are not prescription drugs, the irony is, even though it's illegal for your health food store to sell it, 
and it's illegal for you know a manufacturer to manufacture and sell to the health food store, it's not illegal for you to buy it. It's not an illegal substance. The police, if they pull you over, they, they won't do anything. Health Canada, if they found out you have it in your home, they won't do anything. It's perfectly legal for you to own because our Food and Drug Act actually only governs commercial transactions. Okay? So for something like natokinase, you can import it for personal use. Go to the Health Canada site and in their search thing, type personal importation, you'll get their guidance document. And I, I'll tell you, basically, <coughs> if they adhere to the law, which is a big if because there are problems at the border I hear about all the time, but if they adhere to the law, they should let your shipment in if it's only a 90-day supply, so no more than that. It can be less, but it can't be more than a three-month supply. <coughs> so listen carefully. If you're trying to save shipment costs by having it shipped for several people, make sure that the shipper puts the name of everyone on the shipping manifest that it's for. Because the Health Canada inspector will do the math. Oh, a bottle says take two a day. It's got 80 bottles. How much month supply? Okay? So as long as it's no more than a three-month supply, they're okay. It has to be coming to a residential address. If it's being shipped to a health food store, they're going to say this is commercial, okay? And so even if your business isn't a health food store, don't have it sent to your business. Oh, okay, Dr. Rowland's product, which is one of his key products. <coughs> yeah, and I've heard nothing but good things. I've actually personally taken that product. It's a so super product. Yeah, that's that's something that's in the market, and you can get it in Canada, and it's kind of safe in North America anymore. Okay, now I'm just going to stop you for a second, and the only reason is, is because this is being videotaped, and if I don't save questions till the end, it will become very difficult for anyone who watches the tape because they can't hear you. Okay? So if... I'm just going to refrain from answering questions for a little while. But back to how you can import. So not to your home address, and then it needs to be in its original packaging. I mean, if they, they see a box full of pills, they're, they're going to think you're going to put it in a bottle or something, okay? So personal importation, educate yourself about that. There's also a loophole. And so any practitioners in here, I want you to listen carefully. There's a loophole. Our natural health product regulations, because of the way they've defined manufacturer, does not apply to a health practitioner who's got authority to practice in the province they're practicing in from compounding for a patient. Now, I mean, the traditional Chinese practitioners do this all the time because it's just the way they, they were taught. You go in there, you get assessed, and they'll put the herbs together for you right there and send you on your way. On something like natokinase, a naturopathic doctor, TCM, medical doctor, can compound or send you to a compound pharmacist, you know, with their written instructions to have it compounded. Health Canada won't touch it. And again, there's a guidance document. Go to Health Canada website if you're a practitioner or a pharmacist. Type in individual compound and you'll find it. Or just go to the NHP part and, and find it. But it's just, I'm thinking that because people's health are suffering, like there's a risk of losing stuff like this, that, you know, the citizens kind of have to adjust to what they're doing. And then the third thing you can do, frankly, is smuggle. <laughs> you know, well, I have. Most of you have. And, you know, really, is it ethically wrong when the government is taking away something that you actually need for your health? I mean, I'll just leave that as a rhetorical question. But I, I certainly, the only thing I'm worried about is being caught. I, I have, don't wake up in the middle of the night going, oh, you broke the law. You know, because I don't respect the law. I just, I simply don't. So, because this is a freedom issue. This is a freedom issue. Do you, you have to understand that the government has taken the position, they took it about eight years ago, that you do not have the right to take anything that they don't approve of. So if Big Brother doesn't approve of it, you do not have the right to take it which is very challenging. I mean, it's interesting. Um, almost everywhere I go, well, in fact, it's 100%, and it'll happen today. Somebody will come up to me and say, you know, I have this condition, and oh my gosh, I was suffering, and I took this chemical pharmaceutical and that and blah, 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 and either it didn't work or the side effects were more than I could tolerate. Like, I just, I couldn't take the drug, and so I'm, like, suffering. I don't know what to do. I come across a natural product, 
and it worked. And we are losing, we will lose about three quarters of the products we had access to before. So what's happened is, prior to 2004, natural health products for all intensive purposes were not regulated. We only had the chemical drug regs. Very few had drug identification numbers under the old system. So literally, if you walked into a health food store prior to 2004, for all intents and purposes, all of the products were technically illegal. Did you feel unsafe? No. No, you don't. I phoned uh, six weeks ago a gentleman who in a different province has a chain of health food stores, very successful, <clears throat> and I just said, hey, today, in your store, how many of the products are illegal? Uh, he kind of thought about it, and he says, probably still 50%. <clears throat> now, some health food stores will not sell any legal products. They're out there. Like, I know of some stores, if it doesn't have a license, they won't sell it. But a lot of stores are still like my friends, where they're basically bringing stuff in because people need it. And he knows he's, you know, he could be raided and charged. But it's an ethical thing for him, because he also knows that the people need the stuff. So, <clears throat> but from a freedom perspective, isn't it challenging so for these people who the only thing that works is a natural product and then you're told you can't have that. You're an educated adult. You've been, you know of the risks. You cannot make a decision, according to Big Brother, to take a product. And that is a freedom issue and it's very, very challenging. Now, <clears throat> I want to encourage people. Do you mind if I go just a little longer? We're Okay. So, because they only give me 45 minutes and usually, usually I get an hour, so I just, I've been fretting for a week. <laughs> so thank you. Um, we really need to start taking action. How many of you know about the Charter of Health Freedom? I'm just curious. Okay, not enough. It should be every hand. There's a website, Charter of Health Freedom. If you just Google Charter of Health Freedom, you will find the website. The Charter, um, this is now, is Julia here? I'm trying to figure out how many years ago did the Charter come into being. It's been like <clears throat> four or five years ago. A bunch of groups got together from across Canada, so practitioners, consumers, um, obviously the NHPPA was involved, had some conferences, and the question was asked, what do we do? Because we're always just reacting, right? We've got these regulations, we're losing products, Health Canada is being unfair. They're not taking into account the health consequences of taking products away. <clears throat> what do we do? Because we're always being reactive, not proactive. And the solution was saying, look, you know, we basically need the equivalent of a Bill of Rights for access to therapeutic products, be they chemical, be they natural. The Charter of Health Freedom has nothing to do with natural health products. It applies to everything. And it basically is a law that we want to have enacted which protects people's right to choose to access a, pro you know, a product that they need. So actually, ironically, it gives the government more teeth now to you know, make sure that only safe things are out there than they currently have, but they can't take away a product if taking it away is going to cause more harm than leaving it on the market. Which, think about that for a second. I, I mean, that's super important, because this is apparently all for our safety, right? right? And remember, I've told you I can't point to a single product, a single death in Canadian history caused by a natural health product. But, you know, if I had time to tell you about True Hope, and some of you are aware of True Hope and Empower Plus, like, they took that product away for about a year, as best they could. Like, there were smuggling rinks all across Canada, but some people ran out. And actually, it was the Canadian Mental Health Association, their pr Alberta branch president, Ron Lachanez, started holding press conferences blaming Health Canada for the suicides. And I, I've called him as a witness and seen him testify under oath He's a heavy hitter in the mental health field. The province of Alberta had him design their mental health programs and run them. He's not a small fish. And for him to publicly hold press conferences blaming Health Canada for suicides, you better believe there were suicides. So I just use that as an example of a single product restricted for a short time. It's freely available now. It even has a license of all things. But it was restricted for a short period of time, and there were, I believe there were deaths. In my opinion, there were deaths. So, you know, anatokinase, I think there could be deaths over this one. In fact, I think there will be deaths over it. We're talking life and death, losing access to these products, and <clears throat> something needs to be done. So that under the Charter of Health Freedom, if it was enacted, they couldn't do that. They'd have to do a balanced risk analysis. Okay, we've identified this risk. 
But if we take the product off the market, are we going to cause more harm than leaving it on the market and managing it in other ways, such as label warnings or educations or only having you know, it under healthcare practitioners? There's different ways of managing risk, but they're, they're not fair. So we need something like the Charter of Health Freedom. I could go on for an hour. Like the Charter of Health Freedom, one thing that we learned from the uh, EMPOWER Plus fiasco is Health Canada ignores your pleas when you call them. So they're restricting EMPOWER Plus. EMPOWER Plus is used to manage people with severe bipolar disorder. Generally at that time, the only people taking it were those people that would trash psych wards and were getting no relief from the chemical pharmaceuticals. There was about a thousand Canadians on it. There were so many people phoning Health Canada begging for their lives. Like the doctors would phone, psychiatrists would call, family members, they would call. There were so many people. We know now from internal Health Canada emails we got through an access to information request that they set up a, a crisis line. It, it sounded good to the public. They do this public announcement, this notice. Oh, we've set up this 1-800 crisis line to help people you know, with the transition away from Empower Plus. So they made it sound like it was for your benefit, but reality, they couldn't function. They were getting so many calls. So if you phoned and said EMPOWER Plus or True Hope, they would hit a button and without your consent, transfer you to this line. And we also have the instructions the people were given on the other end of the line and basically to say it's not authorized, go back to your doctor. But these people made a mistake. They took notes. And there's about 800 pages of notes of people begging for their lives. And I'm not kidding. Health Canada summarized to, you know, the higher ups. There's a and they, they've agreed to me in cross examination there was a consistent theme of suicides. Like it's right in the notes, what are you gonna do when I commit suicide? And we know some of the people did. Like but they're begging for their lives. They don't listen to you. So one of the things the Charter of Health Freedom does is it creates a health freedom ombudsman so that if you were ever in that situation, at least there's somebody to publicly shame the government into stopping what they're doing. See, we need a whole bunch of protections. Like I said, I could just go on about the Charter, but you know, next time I lecture in front of you and I say, who's heard of the Charter? I want every hand to go up. The Charter, on the Charter website, there are also petitions you can download and have people fill out and then mail them to the address on the bottom. I forget, I think we have about 85,000 signatures now. It's just growing and growing and we want we want it basically it to become the largest petition in Canadian history. So educate yourself about the Charter. And I also, you need to support groups. If you're a professional, a practitioner, um, you know, some of the groups out there just simply aren't doing enough. Get involved in your group and get them to get active about this because it actually, there's health consequences. And I certainly invite you to support groups like the one I'm involved with, the Natural Health Product Protection Association. Like we had to like do a call just so that even my travel out here could be covered. This stuff costs, right? You know, to lecture, to publish, to all of this stuff, it costs. And you know, we have to, we have to have staff and things like that and we're cash starved. So whether it's our group or another group, you know, it's one thing to say, yeah, I support health freedom, but I'm not gonna financially support any groups that I actually think are trying to do a good job. It just doesn't work because they're just gonna disappear and they're not gonna be effective. So. I implore you, if you actually care about this stuff, especially if you're a practitioner, pick a group that you can get behind and support them monthly. Not, a, oh, I sent 100 bucks six months ago, I'm fine. You send 100 bucks a month. Like, support them monthly so they can actually know what their income is and plan and do things. Right? It just make, and then get involved. I definitely want everyone to log on to the NHPPA site. I know that's a mouthful. Just NHP for natural health products and then protection association. So it's, you know, and we're a .org, but if you just Google NHPPA, you'll find us. And there's a, a subscribe button where, you know, if you click it, we're going to ask for your email address. <coughs> we need when things happen to be able to alert people, A, that they're happening, and sometimes to ask you to take action. Like an example that comes to mind is, is um, a couple of years ago when the Consumer Product Safety Act, their second try at passing it, it had got through the House of Commons and it was in the Senate, and uh, some people were wanting me to go and testify in front of the Senate, and the Senate was saying no. But we sent out an alert to, to the different, you know, to people on our list saying, pressure the Senate, and like there were calls and letters, and all, voila, they called, and then they amended it and sent it back to the House, and we prevented it for a year. It, it died in the House. Harper probed. It actually made a, a substantive dis difference. And so just my point is, 
if the groups have no way of contacting you to say something needs to be done, then you have no way of knowing that you need to do something. So plug yourself in, like educate yourself, plug yourself in, become active, because this is important. There's a health consequence. I'm just going to leave you with a quote from Thomas Jefferson. And I, I'm going to read it twice, because just once isn't enough. But I, I want you to think about this. Uh, and he said, if we allow the government to tell us what food to eat or medicine to take, we are subjecting ourselves to the worst form of tyranny. Wow, isn't that powerful? Uh, and I do have to read it again. It's just too powerful. If we allow the government to tell us what food to eat or medicine to take, we are subjecting ourselves to the worst form of tyranny. We are, collectively, in this room, we are, we are allowing the government to tell us what food to take. We're allowing the government to tell us what medicines we can take. We are, it's a fact, we're subjecting ourselves to the worst form of tyranny because if the government controls our body, we're, sh we're slaves. I mean, there's just no other way to explain it in, in freedom terms. So thank you for your attention. And uh, I, will, I will answer some questions if there are some questions. So, so <coughs> you were first. You know what I might do is I might plug this mic in just so that the video gets the questions. And so, yeah, or I can repeat the questions. That works just as well. So ask the question and then I'll repeat it. And Oh, that's the California one? Yeah. Okay, so the question is, for those of you who aren't aware, there was a proposition um, in California, if they go through certain hoops, they, they have a referendum on issues. And one of the propositions was to have mandatory labeling of GMO foods, and it didn't pass. Yeah, that was just at the last week in the presidential election. Um, <coughs> so the question, I guess, is, is am I aware of that? And the answer is yes, and I cannot get my head around okay. how that could possibly fail. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask you. If you had any idea as to like... No, I have only heard speculation and... And there was a ton of support with that one as well. And it's still... But nobody is talking about why or next step that can be better go and Yeah, and, it, and it's a real loss because the hope was California is such a big market that if California had required mandatory GMO labeling, that basically the big food companies would have to stop processing food with GMO. So it's, it's a huge loss for all of us because in Canada, they don't have to label GMO. As I've just outlined, now they can grant exemptions and we won't even know that they're adding GMOs to our foods. We, you, you'll have no way of even finding out. And, you know, I know I've listened to Michael S Smith. It's Smith, the GMO expert, great guy. And you can go on to his, it's Citizens for Safe Technology is his site, and he lists the foods that are GMO, and I really recommend that people educate themselves, because at least if, you know, if a, enough of us stop buying GMO foods, it may have a difference. Now, you had a question? Monsanto was putting a million dollars a day into suppressing that being in California. Okay, and I'll just repeat what she said. She said Mo Monsanto was spending a million dollars a day to stop that from passing. So. Yeah. And you know, there was also a thing, like, I don't know if you've noticed it, but there was a, a, a few articles coming out that um, organic and commercial, like regular food, are the same. There's no benefit to the organic product. So I know a lot of my clients came to me and they're like, pretty much, are you a quack? Because we're just coming out on global news. And then if I looked into it and the researchers that did the research were Monsanto's researchers and they were also funded by Monsanto. And I'm sure they were perfectly objective, right? <laughs> well, I know it's just, it's scary. Like, you know, it's so interesting because they're so anal retentive about anything on natural health products. You've got to list this and that and test this and that. They've done no safety testing on GMOs. And even to resist labeling, I just, I can't get my head around it. So I'll, I'll take your question and then I'll take yours.
Well, it doesn't, it doesn't, okay, so the question is, is with these changes in Bill C-38, does that basically affect labeling of GMO, f or of organic foods, or organic foods at all? Oh, you know, that is a really good question, because, you know, the organic thing is certified by other groups, not Health Canada. So it really shouldn't. It's a different issue whether Health Canada would allow that claim meeting different criteria, which I guess they could. I mean, they, they could under the old law. I don't think that's what it's directed at. I mean, I, I really think it's probably to be allowing more GMO ingredients. And I really think that we're looking at harmonization with European um, law. And what I didn't mention, but it's, it's also very scary, and you probably have noticed in your newspaper, I'm noticing it, at least every other week, there'll be some report about how close we are to reaching a trade agreement with the European yeah. Union. It's called the Comprehensive Economic Trade Agreement. But nobody is given the text that they're negotiating on, so nobody can say, is it going to be covering natural health products? Is, we know it's going to be covering drugs because the media is reporting that they're haggling over you know, intellectual property rights and patent issues. So I have a real concern that you know, here we've been gutted with these NHP regulations, but at the end of the day, we're going to be subject to, you know, harmonization with Europe, which would just be an absolute disaster. Like, we'll need your email address then, because it would be like Bill C-51, we'll be in full war mode, so, and quickly. So, yeah, it's worrisome. Now, at the, you had a question, yes. You know, I actually, I'm not aware that we, we didn't, we didn't abolish any of the, we didn't change the regulations, the labeling requirements, but whether or not they were juggling, you know, inspectors and stuff like that. Like, what happened to every department is the Harper government did give directions saying you had to reduce your budget, um, and most departments haven't, it's been in the news, most departments haven't given their plan yet, but I've definitely heard that the NHPD was going to be losing staff and that potentially, you know, we were going to be losing some inspectors. Both of those I would view as positive things. But, um, yeah, I wasn't, I, I, if I was told about on the food inspection side, like they are different inspectors, I've forgotten or either I haven't been told. So I'm sorry I can't really answer that. Okay, right at the back. And just, if, no, but if I, if I can follow up, the advantage of that is, is like, let's say you were bringing in something that you're, you can legally personally import. The problem with the mail is, you know, it gets to customs, and then what customs does is they alert Health Canada, who then determines to recommend entry or to refuse entry, and then customs will almost invariably follow Health Canada's direction. Is you're subject to a Health Canada inspector getting it right, that, that no, 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 this is for personal importation. If you're bringing it across the border yourself, you know, you can argue with customs over it. No, this is personal importation, right? So, and if it's something you're not supposed to have, then don't mention it. But, <laughs> so, well, it's just, you know, like they're going to, they're allowing cava again, and I remember, I for sure, I smuggled cava in. But it's legal to possess, so there you go. Yes?
Right. Yeah, well, I mean, I uh, have said publicly that I actually believe our whole regulations are what economy or economists would describe as rent-seeking, like our natural health product regulations. So because you think about it, <coughs> the regulations came about in the you know, early and mid-90s, Health Canada started attacking natural health products with the drug regulations, which you really couldn't comply with. And people were becoming so alarmed that there really was a citizen rebellion. Like, it's funny, this lady here, I, you know, before the lecture started, we looked at the size of the room and she says, you know, back in the mid-90s, there would be a thousand people here. It's true. Like, the consumer was very alive and, um, and the consumer pressure basically forced the government to say, okay, we're going to look at how should we regulate natural health products. The Standing Committee of Health looked at it and came out with their famous 53 recommendations. But the whole, and everyone agrees, Health Canada, everyone agrees, the message from the consumer was we wanted increased access. Okay, that was our message. You were taking our products away, we communicated clearly, we want increased access. We don't want the same, we want increased. Well, they come out with drug style regulations. <clears throat> so, I mean, in the United States, the same products are perfectly legal and they don't have to get licensed. And that's the problem with our new regulations is basically every product is deemed illegal. That's the, the default position. Everything's illegal and only those products that can get a license will be allowed to remain on the market. And we're still in this transition process um, trying to get through the licensing process. And it sounds great on paper. In fact, I've had skeptics interrupt lectures and then ask questions. You know, surely, you know, we should not allow Canadians to have, have access to products that are not proven safe and are not proven effective. And it, act, it, does, it sells well in the media and people like that. But the flip side is, is okay, but if you're going to impose that, we're going to lose a whole bunch of products, including ones that people rely on for their lives. And if you did a, an honest risk analysis, you would conclude there's more harm in removing products. I mean, is everyone familiar with Professor Ron Law? He's a risk analysis expert in New Zealand. And I actually met him in Toronto at a, a conference we were both speaking on on natural health products. And a client of mine hired him using Canadian government statistics to basically determine, well, what are the risks caused by natural health products compared to other things? Because risk is relative, right? If somebody says, oh, this is dangerous, well, ask dangerous compared to what? And I still laugh at the risk analysis because according to Canadian government statistics, as a Canadian, okay, it's important as a Canadian, not as a member of any other country, as a Canadian, you are dramatically more likely to be bitten by a shark than to be harmed, not killed, but to be harmed by a natural health product, okay? Now, I'm sorry I mentioned sharks because I know Canadians are really worried about being bitten by sharks because it happens so often. I mean, funnily, <laughs> funnily, it, it actually, it does happen now and again because so many of us travel, the odd one gets bitten by a shark. But it's just, it's not something we're losing sleep over because it is just such a remote risk and you're way more likely to be struck by lightning than harmed by a natural health product. It's just from a risk analysis scale, there's hardly any risk at all. So why are we trying to prove it's safe? Like my favorite example was Nature Sunshine tried to get a license for parsley that's put in a capsule. Now they finally did it, but the first time they failed because they could not prove to Health Canada that parsley was safe. But you know, you can feel their pain because if you and I were submitting a license application for parsley, could we find any clinical trials showing parsley was safe? <clears throat> I mean, they want scientific evidence. Well, no, it turns out people have not done clinical trials showing that parsley is safe. So how are you going to prove it? I mean, it's just, it's ridiculous, isn't it? Yeah. So it's just absolutely ridiculous. I'm sure there was a question over here. Do um, you have another question? Um, this time to regulate, regulate supplementation, but do you think that that will happen? And if it does, what will happen to our supplements and health care products? Okay, and I'd actually realized then I didn't finish your question. I got off on a tangent. So, because I, I was saying, I, what I think is happening here is rent seeking. So, my whole point was Canadians asked for greater access, and then we get drug style regulations that you don't have to be a rocket scientist. Just wait, if every product's deemed illegal and only those that can jump through certain hoops can remain, we're going to lose access, right? So, we got regulations that are the exact opposite, and 
manufacturers and distributors will tell you that the requirements are just overkill. They increase your costs and they're, you know, repetitive and you have to hire more staff to comply and all of this. And so what happens is, is it drives smaller manufacturers and medium-sized manufacturers out of business and leaves the big guys standing. And so there's actually, let me find, there's a, a research piece was done when the regulations were being phased in where small firms were asked, do you support the regulations? Medium-sized firms, do you support the regulations? And big firms were asked, do you support the regulations? And <coughs> I, somewhere in here I, I have a quote, but basically it's to the effect, you know, a big firm was quoted as saying, well, you know, it's going to drive our competition out of business, so quit slow bleeding us. Let's do this quickly, right? So, uh, yeah, I mean, think about it. If you and I were um, directors of a big company and our analysis showed, yeah, this is going to be painful and it's going to increase our costs, but it's going to get rid of half of our competition and then our sales will go up, we would actually be ethically bound by our shareholders. We'd have a fiduciary duty to them to support the regulations, a legal fiduciary duty to support the regulations because it was going to increase value for our shareholders. That's scary, isn't it? Like, because we're so money-oriented, we're not taking a step back and going, wait a second, ethically, people are going to die and people are going to suffer and we need to... Like, our whole society is screwed up right now. It, it just it is. Like, we're not taught to be ethical. We're not taught to actually consider what our actions are on other people and we're just so driven by greed and the dollar right now, it's disquieting. I mean, people are starting to wake up and... I think in the next couple of years it will be a different culture, but that is a different lecture. <laughs> okay, so I'll, I'll take one more question and then it, it's late and we'll go. So, yes. Um, I recall listening to you speak earlier, um, I guess the angst and frustration I experienced when talking to our local MP with regard to C36. Okay, the Consumer Product Safety Act. She said that to you. Yeah, and I desperately wish I could teleport you in, drag her to a chair, <laughs> impart the eloquence and wisdom you possess, and get it into her head. Yeah, it, it's funny. You know where we're supposed to be civil. I was lecturing uh, in Aurora. I think this was last year or the year before, and uh, <coughs> you know this, the local MP was there. Yes, Lloyd. And based no, no, it was a so it mustn't be the local MP, but it was a guy. And he was saying, oh, yeah, you know, we need, we need this for safety. Yeah, and okay, it was all I could do not to hit him. <laughs> I know, I, I really, I, I just thought this would just be easier. <laughs> so, because there's just, they have no conception. And there's just, you know, I don't care what the reason for enslaving us that you give us. You're enslaving us. And, you know... If you ask your MP, well, has there been a risk analysis from Health Canada showing to justify removal of these products? Has there been a risk analysis showing the danger of removing the products? No. I've asked. I've asked uh, access to information requests. They don't exist. This is all being done, I think, because big companies have pressured the government to impose this rent, rent seeking. That's all it is. Like, how can you say, oh, yeah, we need to make it illegal for Canadian stores to sell stuff like natokinase when Canadians can still buy it. If it was a safety issue, you would ban us from buying it. Wouldn't you? So, yeah, it just it makes no sense. I really thank you for coming, and I really thank you for listening, just because I'm passionate about waking people up, because this is so serious. Like, when I say it's an ethical issue, I'm just so not kidding. And... I'm starting to feel like I've gotten, I've probably been asked a hundred times at the show, you know, are we making any progress, right? Because sometimes, you know, I feel like I'm just hitting my head up against the wall. And I've said publicly for years, it's got to get worse before it gets better. And, and I think it actually needs to get a lot worse before it gets better. So it's going to get worse. But as it gets worse, like understand that's part of our healing process because until it gets bad enough that people can't deny it, 
once, once it gets to that point, we'll change it. Like people, people will, Canadians will not stand for slavery. So we will change it, but it is going to get worse first. So please don't get discouraged or anything. It just, it has to. That's the process. So because en- enough have to wake up and they, they're in denial right now, but it will happen. So my parting word is don't be discouraged. This is going to be a bit of a slog out fight over several years. You know, get plugged in, be educated, but, you know, we will win because we'll wake up. Like, we just will. So it's okay for it to get worse. Okay. Are the organizations working together for, like, mass protests or something? No, absolutely not. The the natural health industry is fragmented. (coughs) Um, And that's just a function of people, right? It doesn't matter what area you look at. There's usually fragmentation because there's personalities involved. And, you know, I'm part of that, too. There's a couple of groups that I'm not interested in working at, um, you know, just for some reasons that it's just not necessary to voice. Um, but that's okay. That, that happens because, you know, some people you can trust, some you can't, some get along with you and some don't, and that's just human stuff. I mean, I think all groups, as things get worse, will do their best you know, put stuff aside, but right now there's some fragmentation. But I don't think we need to be so unified. I look at Bill C-51. Everyone did their own thing, but so many people did it that we stopped it, right? So, I mean, I think it'll be the same as the 90s, is people draw closer and closer together the worse it gets. And I think it's important for all of us to realize we have to set emotions and personalities aside as best we can because this is so important. So yeah, that was a very good question. Okay, thanks again. Thank you.